Today we're going to talk about what the best diet for a human is. Now we're going to take attributes of different epidemiological data and we're going to understand what has worked for different cultures and apply it into a simple, simple playbook for you to use in your daily life. Because it's not easy for me to say, hey, this particular diet worked great for these people, you should eat everything that they ate. That doesn't really work. But we can apply principles of what has worked for them and we can apply principles that have worked for other cultures that have great longevity, great vitality, great overall fitness. Okay, So I'm going to make this very simple and give you takeaways along the way leading up to a very important series of pillars that I think you should follow. And there's also some components of these pillars that have been outlined by research journals that I think are flawed. And we need to course correct that and I need to get my spin on it so that you can get what I think is the optimal outcome. I put a link down below for ButcherBox too if you want to get some really like seriously amazing tasting bison. They have amazing ground bison and amazing grass-fed, grass-finished ground beef, which dude, I really do think that that ground beef is I think ground beef is underrated. Like you get collagen with it. You get some of the gristle that's actually good for you. But man, we throw that sucker out. That's like, we always say, oh, it's the nice cuts of meat that we want. The ground beef is where it's at. Anyhow, so that link down below gets you grass-fed, grass-finished cuts of meat. Not only the cuts of meat, but the ground beef, but also chicken options, pork options, scallops, other seafood options, real bacon, good stuff, all at that link down below. And then it gets delivered to your doorstep. So it takes one step out of the prep. Seriously, give them a shot. It's called ButcherBox. It'll change your life, at least as far as the quality is concerned. Like if you go to the grocery store and you look at meat now, it's like bright red. It's like not even the way it's supposed to be. You look at ButcherBox, it's like a deep red, the way that it should look. Anyhow, that link is down below, top line of the description. So to kick this off, we look at a paper that was published in 2021 in the International Journal of Epidemiology. It looked at close to 5,000 people investigating longevity with diet. What they ultimately discovered is that the closer that people adhered to Mediterranean principles, the better their overall longevity outcome was. The further that people distanced from Mediterranean principles, which we'll talk about in a minute what those are, the higher their disease or death risk. On average, five to eight years shorter lifespan if they were distanced from Mediterranean style eating. So what does this mean for you though? Well, if we look at other epidemiological data from a little bit further back, there was one paper that looked at over half a million people. And what this basically paved out is it spells it out perfectly. 6% less risk of cancer, 13% less risk of Alzheimer's, and a 9% less risk of cardiovascular disease. So we're looking at some pretty serious numbers there that really mean a lot. But with that, what are we applying? What do you need to do to your diet? Well, at the peak of all of these Mediterranean principles, it's not eat delicious pasta and things like that. No, it's insulin sensitivity. If you really look at what is working for these cultures and what is working with this diet, it's a lot of insulin sensitivity. Now let's take a look at extra virgin olive oil for just a second. Okay, high monounsaturated fats. What this extra virgin olive oil can do for a cell membrane is it makes the membrane on the outside of our cell very fluid. Okay, It's called membrane fluidity. And that means that that cell can receive a signal from insulin very, very well. Now, if we look at olive oil a little bit further, we see olive oil has antioxidants like hydroxytyrosol. Okay, what these do is these actually help insulin be produced. Now, what's interesting is that we've been conditioned recently to think that insulin is bad. Insulin is like a special forces troop, okay? We need it in a very quick fashion. If we had special forces troops infiltrating all the time, it would be too much, right? But if the special forces troops go in, they do their job, and they get out, it creates the perfect situation that we might need, right? So in this case, we have insulin being produced, we have it getting to the cell, and then it leaves. Compare that to like a standard American diet where insulin is chronically elevated, well, that's a problem, right? So what I want you to do, no matter what kind of diet you're doing, is consume four to five tablespoons of olive oil per day. That is step one, okay? Add that into your diet. Okay, but now let's move on a little bit more. Monounsaturated fats are a staple in a Mediterranean culture. Now, that means things like, again, extra virgin olive oil, 
macadamia nut oil would technically fall into this category, even though it may not be Mediterranean by specific standards. 80% monounsaturated fat content with macadamia nut oil. What these monounsaturated fats do inside your body is really cool. They increase something called PPAR. What PPAR does is when this is expressed, it encourages your body to use fats more. Okay, it trains your body. So PPAR is like, think of it as like, you just leveled up to a new category in your body where now your body knows how to utilize fats. And this isn't something that you unlearn. Your body learns this and it stays with you for life as long as your diet is good and healthy, right? So if you elevate and you activate PPAR, this receptor protein, then this is beneficial all the way around. And a lot of monounsaturated fats will trigger this. So very, very cool. Another thing that these monounsaturated fats do is really drive up what's called uncoupling protein two, okay? Now this sounds complicated and it is, but in essence what it's doing is it's driving up the body's ability to burn fuel as heat, okay? The more uncoupling proteins you have, the more fuel you are dissipating, calories that you are consuming, you are dissipating as heat like an old school radiator heater in a college dorm room. Electricity goes in and it radiates as heat. Calories come in and they radiate as heat. It's like free calories. But think about it, you're constantly in a burning state which is very good for the body to keep you lean. There's also huge amounts of satiety that come in from monounsaturated fats. So if you look at Mediterranean cultures in the first place, their appetite is not out of control. Sure, they don't have the hyperpalatable processed like garbage that we have in the United States, but they're also like very controlled with that. So what does that look like for you? Well, in addition to the four to five tablespoons of olive oil per day, even though macadamia nuts might be on the higher end of the price spectrum, the benefit you get is huge and well worth it. So one to two ounces of macadamia nuts per day, you can reap a huge benefit from. Or you can substitute that with one to three tablespoons of macadamia nut oil. Okay, that way you're getting direct oil without having to use the nut. Might even be a little more cost effective for you. So now we have two staples that you can inject into your life to start migrating towards a Mediterranean approach without moving to Italy. This next piece is a hot button topic. And fair warning, it might upset you a little bit depending on what side of the lane you sit on, okay? The LDL cholesterol discussion is one that needs to be had, okay? And regardless of where you stand on LDL being good or LDL being bad, regardless of where you stand, most Americans have elevated small dense LDL, the bad kind of LDL that should not be elevated. We're not talking about people doing carnivore. We're not talking about the ketogenic diet where things might be different. We're talking about the standard diet. And as a general whole, we need to bring this number down, okay? The powerful effect of polyphenols, monounsaturated fats, some polyunsaturated fats on just the hyperlipidemic effect is unbelievably strong. And here's how it simply works mechanistically. One thing we can all agree on is bringing down small, dense LDL, the bad, true bad LDL, not the fluffy LDL. Bringing that down is probably a good thing. The wholesome amounts of fiber and soluble fibers that are in a Mediterranean style diet can bring this number down because it delays and slows the absorption out of the digestive system. Now here's what's wild. Digestive cholesterol, or what you're bringing in from food, dietary cholesterol, does not influence blood cholesterol all that much. But when you decrease the amount that is absorbing for a period of time, LDL uptake in the liver can increase. So your liver has these docking stations, okay? Think of your liver as like a big harbor. It has these docking stations for LDL, okay? When LDL is circulating, it docks into the liver, does its job, and leaves, right? But if those docks are all occupied, then LDL piles up because it doesn't have a place to go. So if you slow down cholesterol absorption for a tiny bit digestively, it allows the process to occur better. Does that apply to someone doing a standard low carb diet? Not necessarily, but it's very important for people to note how that works overall. Now, in this particular case, a Mediterranean approach has a moderately low saturated fat content. We're talking like seven to 10% of total daily calories. That's not devoid of saturated fat. That's moderately reduced. Saturated fat will occupy LDL receptors. It's not a good, bad, or ugly thing. It's just the way it is. But if saturated fat is occupying these receptors in someone that already has elevated levels of LDL, think about it. 
there's nowhere else for the LDL to go. Okay. So by increasing the kind of whole food, fiber, whole fruits, monounsaturated fats, we can positively influence this. And no matter how you want to come at that and say that that could be bad, I'll take it because I think generally speaking, most people need to have this taken care of. So with that, what do you consume to help with that whole process? Well, with this, I recommend aiming for 20 to 40 grams of good quality fiber, predominantly coming from things like soluble fiber. Okay, so in this particular case, good fruits and veggies, okay, asparagus where you're gonna get some long chain inulin, artichokes, some of these veggies like that, the occasional bit of chia, the occasional bit of flax, the occasional uh, psyllium, things like that. So we don't need to eat perfectly Mediterranean regional foods, but we apply these principles with the soluble fiber to help out with this whole like hyperlipidemia, right? To be able to help this out. Now let's kind of move on. Now we've talked about adding the olive oil, we've talked about adding the macadamia nuts, we've talked about adding the fiber. What about the protein piece? The protein piece, in my opinion, is one of the most important. And if you look at a standard Mediterranean diet, it's a moderate amount of protein. But the protein that they're consuming is generally fairly lean, and they're getting their fats, again, from the olive oil, they're getting their fats from the other kind of like different oils and nuts and seeds that are in their diet, okay? Keeping that insulin sensitivity high. So what does the protein intake look like? What should you aim for? I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that the best course of action that I would say for most people would be start at a half a gram of protein per pound of body weight. And if you're more active, you can increase it from there, trying not to really exceed much more than one gram per pound of desired body weight. Now, you could probably go more if you're accustomed to that, but I feel safe saying that 0.5 to one gram per pound of body weight is a great place to be. So now we have some framework here and you can start building out your diet. But the next step, they don't eat a lot of sugar. There's not a lot of refined sugars, not a lot of refined starches. Sure, there's some pastas, there might be some wholesome breads, there might be things like that, which I am not the biggest fan of having in the equation, but there's no sugar. So now we have another thing we can add in, no sugar. You see what happens when there's lower levels of sugar and we don't have chronically elevated insulin levels, we're able to keep triglycerides down a little bit more. You see, if we have a lot of carbohydrates coming in, then triglycerides are going to build up because insulin is going to stop the breakdown of the triglyceride into a fatty acid. Essentially what that means is every time insulin is elevated, triglycerides don't get broken down. So triglycerides will pile up, pile up, pile up. So when you're looking at longevity and the impact of triglycerides on health, we do wanna bring that number down. And the best way we can probably bring that number down is A, controlling our fat intake a little bit, but also reducing our carbohydrate intake. But there's something we can add into the mix. We already talked about reducing sugar, eliminating sugar, but omega-3s from good quality fatty fish or omega-3s in modern amounts from supplementation can actually influence triglyceride synthesis, okay? So we can actually lower the amount of triglycerides formed. So now what do we have into the mix? Well, now we've talked about olive oil, four to five tablespoons. We've talked about macadamia nuts. We've talked about 0.5 grams of protein. We've talked about eliminating sugar. And now we've talked about trying to aim for just more omega-3s. I can't give you an arbitrary number. Just aim for more or take an omega-3 supplement to at least get that number up a little bit more. Now we move into a critical component, the oxidative stress component. As we get older, we have more and more and more DNA damage that is accumulating in our body and our body has to deal with it. We have oxidative stress that piles up like crazy. We can pop a bunch of supplements to try to counteract this, or we consume adequate amounts of fruit, adequate amounts of veggies that are rich in these antioxidants and polyphenols. Now, there was a study that was published in the FASEB journal that was very interesting. It found that subjects that consumed extra virgin olive oil had a 13% reduction in urinary 8-oxodeoxyguanosine levels. What the heck does that mean? 8-oxodeoxyguanosine is a marker of DNA damage, okay? So when you have high levels of this in the urine, it means that you have a lot of DNA damage. So extra virgin olive oil, just because the antioxidant components decrease this amount. So one more reason to be bringing these kinds of antioxidant-rich oils in, okay? Now, the fruits and veggies are playing a big part too. Now, I'm a firm believer that a small amount of fruit is probably the potent way to go. 
things like wild blueberries, things like organic blueberries, raspberries, things like blackberries, any kind of berry that is polyphenol antioxidant rich. And I recommend aiming for one cup per day. You don't have to go crazy. One cup. You know how many carbs that is? We're talking 15 grams of carbs or so. And if you go with strawberries, it's probably even less. Okay. Try not to go for the genetically modified stuff because it's genetically modified to be sweeter and it's going to have higher sugar content. Whereas when you're looking at Mediterranean cultures, they don't have that genetically modified stuff like we do in the United States. So try to opt for the organic. And if you have to go frozen, that's fine too, because there's nothing wrong with it. The frozen, in fact, in, in keeps all of its nutrients intact, possibly even more than the fresh berries. Now, the next thing that really, really is important is they practice this fragmented or fractal eating. They don't eat just to eat, okay? If they're not hungry for lunch, they'll skip lunch. They'll eat breakfast and then they'll skip lunch. Maybe they'll eat dinner. And then maybe they'll eat a bigger breakfast or maybe they'll eat a bigger dinner. But it's totally random and it's fractal. And this applies to basically what we've been teaching here, or at least what I've been teaching with intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is just a very clear, planned way of doing this, but you can do it intuitively by just listening to your body. Now, everything that I've been talking about is designed to help you restore these hunger cues so that you're not just eating because the brain signal's telling you to eat. You're eating because you truly need the nutrition. And that allows you to have periods of time without food. So having these periods of time without food allow you to regain that insulin sensitivity and absorb and soak up food when it's time to actually absorb and suck up food. Now, there is another kind of weave with the Mediterranean approach that we can factor in here if you want to take it to another level. And that is what is called the Spanish Mediterranean keto approach, which has been talked about in various publications. This is where you apply everything that we've been talking about here with the Mediterranean approach, but you eliminate the fruits or you keep the fruits very low and you focus a lot more on the fats and the proteins. You're basically doing a low carb protocol. Now, what I would recommend is applying everything I've talked about, just doing it in a lower carb fashion for three months, and then cycle three months with more carbohydrates, then go three months lower carbohydrates. So I consider that an important pillar. And this is important because we wanna maintain our glucose tolerance. If we go low carb for too long, we sort of lose the ability to process carbohydrates very effectively. So we still need to kind of dangle the carrot every now and then to encourage the body to know how to use these carbohydrates best. So I think a three month cycling approach of a three month lower carb ketogenic Mediterranean approach, followed by a three month moderate carb with about 100 to 150 grams of good quality carbs coming from legumes, coming from things like fruit, coming from starchy vegetables, not refined garbage, not pastas, not breads, not things like that. This allows us to maintain that glucose tolerance integrity while also still regaining insulin sensitivity. So now we're getting a really serious playbook on what to do here. We'll recap at the end more. So the BMC Medicine uh, Journal published this like four pillars of a Mediterranean approach, which was very good, but it's, it's boring and it's stuff we kind of know and it doesn't teach us a lot. He said, one, follow Mediterranean principles with your diet. Okay, that's stuff we've talked about. Two, don't smoke. Okay, well, I think we kind of know that smoking's bad. Three, lower your BMI. I have serious problems with this one because I, by BMI standards, am morbidly obese. I do not think that my muscle mass is hurting my longevity. In fact, most of the evidence suggests that a moderate amount of muscle mass is helping your longevity. Okay, and then the fourth pillar they said is be active. I absolutely agree with that. Easier said than done. So rather than leave you with this blanket stuff from this journal, which is great stuff, let's expand on it more. So rather than focusing on our BMI, we need to focus on improving our waist to hip ratio. How do we improve that? Well, we focus on the foods that are gonna improve burning fat more. So we focus on things that improve sleep, okay? Sleep is going to be one of the best things to help out that central adiposity. So, I know you want practical, pragmatic things. The simplest way that we can start oxidizing more fat is probably to keep our insulin levels a little bit lower or at least controlled and do a decent amount of resistance training and zone two cardio. So with the exercise and activity piece, I say set a goal of walking 10,000 steps per day and try to do four times per week 
30 minutes of zone two cardio. Zone two cardio is where you can still hold a good conversation while doing cardio activity. Okay, these simple things are very important, very basic. Now, the other thing is we have to become metabolically flexible. That is probably the most important piece. And by being metabolically flexible, it's exactly what I mentioned earlier. You have the ability to utilize carbs when it's time to use carbs, and you have the ability to use fats when it's time to use fats. So what you wanna do is, again, this cycling approach. So what do you eat more of when you're reducing carbohydrates? Well, you might be increasing the amount of seeds that you eat. You might eat a little bit more nuts. You might eat some more avocado. You might eat some more olive oil. But what about things like cheeses? What about things like dairy? What about stuff like this? Well, it's a great question because you don't wanna think that saturated fats are just bad and you have to avoid them because that's not the case. The cheeses, and you wanna choose cheeses that are aged. You wanna choose cheeses that are preferably coming from like a goat or a sheep instead. Just a little bit easier to control, especially if you're in America. Okay, but you also wanna focus on that aged microbial content. So things like Pecorino Romano, tremendous cheese. Okay, Parmesan, tremendous cheese to use. Smoked aged Gouda, doesn't have to be smoked, but aged Gouda is always going to be a good one. Any kind of Swiss cheese is gonna be high in conjugated linoleic acid, which is super good for the metabolism as well. Okay, so now we have this whole playbook. Olive oil, macadamia nut oil, lean protein, lots of eggs, things like that, lean fish, lean chicken, no sugar, reducing the sugar, fractal eating, taking breaks from food, giving yourself a break, one to two cups of berries per day, even if you're lower carb, incorporate cheeses like a quarter cup or a half a cup of these aged cheeses, real true seeds, okay? If you're gonna eat seeds, eat them in their true form. No seed oils, no refined seed oil garbage, no soybean oil. Get the fats from the true nuts and the true seeds. Try to go for that option. The carbohydrates you should be consuming when you're cycling in and out of carbohydrate phases, legumes, starchy vegetables, fruits, things like that. So I hope this gives you a big playbook of what you can follow and what you can implement as the best diet for a human being. I'll see you tomorrow.